Good evening, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Sarah Tarcia, and I am the Acting Manager of Public Services at the North Vancouver City Library. Oh, um, Tanche, hello. As I already mentioned, my name is Sarah. I grew up on the shared territories of the Kwantlen, the Wasonic, the Stolo, the Katsi, and the Semiamu peoples. My grandparents on my mother's side are of European descent and come from Aotearoa, what is now known as New Zealand. My grandparents on my father's side are European and Cree Métis, and they come from the Métis homeland on Treaty 1 territory in what is now known as Winnipeg. We are presenting this virtual program to you today from the shared territories of the Squamish, the Tsleil-Waututh, and the Musqueam nations. We recognize that you may be joining us from different territories, so we do encourage you to visit uh, www.whose.land to learn more about the territory on which you reside. As a settler on the traditional ancestral, ancestral and unceded territories of the Coast Salish people, I am very grateful to live and work on these lands that have been and continue to be stewarded um, with such care by the Coast Salish people. I seek to be in good relations with the Squamish, the tsleil and the Musqueam nations, so I strive to learn from them and reflect that learning in my professional and personal life. So now, with great pleasure, I would like to introduce, introduce Sit Sahimat um, of the Squamish. She's of Squamish and Musqueam descent. She's devoted her life to preserving the Squamish language, Salish weaving, and cultural teachings that have been handed down to her from her late papa and his papa, and so on and so on since the beginning of time. Sit Sahimat has performed worldwide, promoting language and culture, representing Coast Salish people, and practicing protocols with song and dance sharing history with storytelling, and weaving workshops to empower her people. She believes that no matter where you are from, it is so important to know your history, your culture, and your ties to the land. So thank you so much for being with us at Sayamat tonight, and I will turn it over to you. Sarah. <laughs> Eighteen at Chantler, Homatsquam, O Home Amen. Yet one heartland squaw and quist back no more, you have eight tea. To high to make Welcome, everybody. My true name is Tita Hima. Thank you so much for acknowledging that. And uh, my nickname or my English name is Rebecca Duncan. I am Scotmish and I am also from the village of Musqueam. It is my honour to welcome you all to our sacred lands of the Coast Salish people this evening. I would like to stress the importance of, of the ties that we have with one another and the ties that we have with our lands and with our ancestors. You know, um, we are people of the salmon, we are people of the longhouse, the longhouse to us is our school, our hospital, and our church. And we're people of the canoes being on the wet, I mean the west coast here. And uh, we're people of the cedar trees. So the cedar has brought so much life for us as Stomoch people. We look to the cedar for spiritual cleansing. We utilize the cedar to make our precious canoes, our Cadillacs. We utilize the cedar for our clothing, our hats, our baskets, and our tools. So my hands go up to each and every one of you for, for taking this time to learn about the beautiful mother tree. It's so important to have that bonding and connections to nature, just to listen to the trees, to, to open your mind, open your heart to the message that may be blowing in the wind, so I'd like to start us, us off in the proper way by following Skotmish protocol. And I'd like to sing a celebration song to celebrate and be grateful for all our trees, our waters, and our lands, and for all the people who are taking care of the trees, the lands, and the animals. So the song is from Aaron Nelson Moody who we all know is Splash and Talk Shin Yehwala. We'll see ya. Check when 
Nancy. I'm Tanoya. Everybody stay safe. Honor your canoe and honor your neighbor's canoe. Be safe. Uh, I can't stress that enough. Be safe in this scary pandemic. It's really, really um, taking its toll. So I ask the creator to bless each and every one of you and your families, your dear children, your dear elders, and um, take that time for self-care and get out there and listen to some trees. Oh, Sam. Thank you so much, Sitsai Matt, uh, for your beautiful opening, um, for your welcome and for your beautiful song as well. Um, so I'd like to now um, welcome everyone again to our North Shore Reads event with Dr. Suzanne Samard in conversation with Sheila Rogers. North Shore Reads is a collaboration between the North Vancouver City Library, the North Vancouver District Public Library, um, and the West Vancouver Memorial Library. We know that our community here on the North Shore treasures the natural beauty around us. So we thought that finding the mother tree would be an app book for us to read um, to, and discuss for our first North Shore Reads collect, uh, selection. We have so much gratitude to the three amazing women who are joining us this evening. Uh, we have previously had the opportunity to work with both Sheila Rogers and Sitse Hamat, and we are so grateful that they are back with us tonight. Um, it was almost exactly a year ago today when we first tried to make contact with Dr. Samard to visit with our libraries to discuss her work with forest ecology. Unfortunately, we had the very bad timing of making that contact just before a high profile piece in the New York Times, which was followed by the announcement of her first book, Finding the Mother Tree. Uh, and then of course there was a subsequent whirlwind of media attention, not to mention the exciting news that her book was optioned to be made into a movie. So we feel so fortunate that we were ultimately able to arrange to have Dr. Samard here tonight to discuss her book, her work, and her life. Um, Dr. Samard is a professor of forest ecology at the University of British Columbia and is, of course, the author of the book Finding the Mother Tree. She's a pioneer on the frontier of plant communication and intelligence and has been hailed as a scientist who conveys complex technical ideas in a way that is dazzling and profound. Her work has influenced filmmakers, um, for example, The Tree of Souls in James Cameron's Avatar, and her TED Talks have been viewed by more than 10 million people worldwide. Dr. Samard is known for her work on how trees interact and communicate using below ground fungal networks, which has led to the recognition that forests have hub trees or mother trees, which are large, highly connected trees that play an important role in the flow of information and resources in a forest. Her current research investigates how these complex relationships contribute to forest resiliency, adaptability, and recovery, and has far-reaching implications for how to manage and heal forests from human impacts, including climate change. Dr. Samard will be joined this evening by Sheila Rogers. Sheila is a veteran broadcast journalist at the CBC and currently the host and a producer of The Next Chapter, a radio program devoted to writing in Canada. In 2011, she was inducted as an honorary witness for the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. That same year, she was inducted into the Order of Canada as an officer for promoting Canadian culture, adult literacy, mental health, and truth and reconciliation. In 2016, Sheila received the first ever Margaret Trudeau Award for mental health advocacy. She holds eight honorary doctorates. Sheila is currently Chancellor of the University of Victoria. 100 years ago this year, her great-grandmother, Edith Rogers, was the first woman and the first Métis woman elected to the Manitoba legislature. legislature. Sheila is a member of the Métis Nation of Greater Victoria. So I'd like to give a very warm welcome to Suzanne and Sheila, and I will turn the evening over to them. Thank you. Oh, what a wonderful welcome. And uh, I want to say Marcy to you, Sarah, and uh, Tanse to everybody. Um, good evening. Uh, thank you, Sitsayamat, for your beautiful welcome and, uh, and, and a celebration song. How lucky are we, Suzanne, to be uh, gifted a celebration song as, as we begin our discussion. I just want to say I'm coming to you this evening from uh, the territories of the Songhees and the Esquimalt Nations in Victoria. And I, I'm very grateful to be able to live here and to work here as well. And um, Suzanne, please feel free to 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 acknowledge where you're coming from. 
Yes, yeah, so thank you so much. And thank you for this amazing welcome. And thank you, Sheila, for being here with me tonight and to the Vancouver Public Library System for um, for having this uh, conversation. And I really appreciate it. I am in Nelson, British Columbia. I am on the unceded territory of the Tanaha, the Sinaiics, and the Okanagan nations. Um, I conduct research throughout British Columbia across many nations up and down the coast and through the interior of the province, which I've um, worked hard to develop relationships and still have a long way to go, but it's um, it's very rewarding. And yeah, and much of the work that I do, I can attribute to the work on that on their land. Well, I want to begin by saying, first of all, you've allowed me to call you Suzanne, so I will. Thank you for that honor. And th thank you for sharing your research and your life with us through this. Uh, it, you know, it reads like a thriller, Suzanne. It's absolutely amazing. So thank you for a thrilling read. I, I want to ask you, first of all, about, um, you know, what they would say in Newfoundland is, who knit you? Um, what are your family's roots in, in British Columbia go back quite a way? Yeah, I mean, I guess it, they go back to the late 1800s um, when my great grandfather, who I never met, um, emigrated across from Quebec to Saskatchewan and then landed in Enderby, <laughs> the Samard side of the family. And Enderby is in the Monashi Mountains or just to the on the edge of it. And uh, my family uh, settled in the in at Maple Lake, which is a great big lake. You know, there's a lot of big lakes in the, that mountainous <laughs> region, and this is one of them. It's um, deep and rich, and it's you know completely enshrouded in in inland rainforests. And so, this is where I grew up. This is what how I got to know forests, and I'm proud of my heritage there. <laughs> what what was their relationship to the forest? Well, my so my great grandfather um, was a horse logger, and so he, the, my family, the Samar family, uh, were in, from Quebec or originally from France, but um, emigrated to Quebec and settled in the Trois Rivières area and did some started logging in that area, and then slowly kind of moved their way to the west to find an easier life, I think. And and I and my great grandfather was actually looking to go to California because he'd heard that it was sunny and warm and you know not as not as cold as the as the Canadian Shield. <laughs> and uh, off they went. So they went, made it to Saskatchewan, overwintered there and it was so cold and harsh that they kept going. And um on a, on a train, a box in box cars. And when they arrived, the box car doors opened and the sun shone through and they thought we're in California. And they jumped out of the, of the train car and up to their eyebrows in snow. <laughs> they were not in California, they were in Enderby. And so that's where they were and that's where we settled. And my great grandfather continued to horse log in those those thick inland rainforests and taught my his son, my my grandpa Henry, and all of his sons, and then my my uncles and dad. Um, so it just you know happened on through the generations. Well, we're on the subject of your family. You you have a lovely passage that I'd I'd love you to read. That's about your family, and it uh, maybe I should do a warning. There may be a few curse words <laughs> in French <laughs> in this reading. Yes, yes. So I'm going to read from uh, from chapter two called Hand Fallers. Um, and this is on page 34 if you want to follow along. <laughs> mm. Hand falling, a single tree took the better part of a day, a week for a patch. Grandpa was the jokester, next to Uncle Wilfred, a shrewd businessman. But both were inventors. Wilfred built a manual elevator with trolleys in his two-story farmhouse. And Grandpa Henry made a water a water wheel on Samard Creek to generate electricity for the houseboats. These old forests grew as high as a 15-story building and Grandpa would locate the straightest trees. He and Uncle Wilfred would stand across from each other on rough-hewn springboards, elevated above the butt swell of the tree, where there was only a slightly smaller fraction of the girth to cut through. They studied the lean of the tree and the lay of the land, then planned the cuts so the tree would fall in the direction of the flume. 
The cross-cut saw sang like a slide guitar as the men sweated it with each push and pull, and sawdust coated their woolen sleeves as they started with the top cut, slicing horizontally through the trunk on the side of the land's downward slope. A third of the way through the bowl, the trunk, they paused for a rest and chewed on some smoked salmon jerky while sap oozed from the cut. Grandpa cursed while studying the tree's particular peculiar lean. Il est un batard, and, and pointed his half chopped off index finger to warn how the tree would fall in at least two directions. Another hour of aching forearms, and they made a bottom cut at the 45 degree angle to the other cut, set to join it deep in the heartwood. Mon chou, Wilfred explained while knocking the wedge of sapwood out of the back of his axe head, leaving a, a yawning grin that resembled their own mouths, since they'd lost most of their teeth to cavities in their teens, now replaced with dentures. With the face cut completed on the lower side, the men sat and ate strawberry shortcake and drank drums of water. They rolled and shared a smoke, Craven A. Then they climbed back onto the springboards to begin the back cut on the other side of the bowl, about an inch above the top cut. Any mills calculation and the timber could buck backward and take their heads off. They dropped the saw when the tree shifted a tad forward, and only a handful of intact fibers were left running up the heart of the tree. Grandpa muttered, Sacrament, as he pounded a metal wedge into the back cut with the blunt end of his axe. The xylem cracked. With a groan, the tree tilted toward the flume as the hand fallers shouted, Timber! and ran as fast as they could upslope. The tree whooshed through the air, its crown catching the wind like a sail, creating such an eddy that the ferns below blew forward, revealing their pale undersides. Branches and needles swirling. In seconds, the tree landed with a deafening thud, the ground shuddering, limbs cracking like bones breaking, a nest of birds catching a draft and floating to the earth in a cloud of feathers. Grandpa Henry and Uncle Wilfred worked along the fallen tree and limbed the branches with axes. They bucked 10 meter long lengths so that prints could haul them more easily to the flume. To do this, the men wrapped the end of each cut piece in a choker, as if setting a lasso around a calf, but their lasso was an iron chain thick as their wrists. For smaller pieces, they cinched the end of the log using a hand-forged tong that opened as wide as a lion's mouth. They hitched the ch choker to the tong to a whiffle tree, a wooden bar carved from a sapling that hung over Prince's tail to tilt and equalize the weight. Prince groaned and snorted as he hauled each bucked log from stump to flume. The brothers then rolled each log into the top of the flume using a peavy, a pole with a swiveling iron hook. Job done. A tree delivered to the water below. They stood sharing another smoke, safe and sound, one more day. One more day. An image and refrain that still punctuates my images of the hand-falling labors of my family. Thank you for, for that lovely reading. And there's so many beautiful metaphors in there. Cross-cut saw sang like a slide guitar might be my favorite. <laughs> Your language is so beautiful. And, uh, and, you. and you're right. I don't want to say poetically, but um, I, I feel such a strong sense of place. I feel like I'm really there. Mm -hmm. And, and, the writing, as I said, is is exquisite. Is this a danger when you're a scientist? <laughs> you know, maybe, yeah, I think so. Um, I think I'm just entering into the danger of the lion's jaw right now. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I, I wanted to be a writer when I was a kid. And uh, my pragmatic side and also my family history sort of led me into forestry. But I always held in my heart that I wanted to write as well. And as a scientist... You know, you're really constrained in your style of writing, um, in in and you really have to carve it down, simplify it so it's 
just telling you the bare raw facts of what you've mm-hmm. done. And I always found that so frustrating that I couldn't express myself. And I felt like I was losing the ability to express myself in that more poetic and creative way. And so I think I was just yearning to, to let myself loose and let, and allow myself to write in the way that came from my heart instead of my head. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, it's, I think that's so important. And I think that one of the reasons people are are grabbing finding the mother tree is that there is that that sense of heart language as well and i think it relates so much to the subject matter that you're dealing with as well yeah yeah um you know it's funny because i i did this incredible research that is sort of like the backbone of this book um and and i felt so frustrated that like nobody really knew about it except for other scientists and, and I knew how important it was um, because of what's happening in our forests, what's happening with our people, the, the link between forests and people. We're, you know, we really need to make some transformational changes and sort of like working around the margins and, and the current narrative wasn't working for us. And, and so I w- really wanted to reach into the hearts of people and tell in a story, as a story, and to really... Um, have people understand that this story began with my life and the questions that I went on to ask in science grew from who I was as a child of the forest in the heart of British Columbia. And so I'm, I hope that I convey that in the book, um, that this has deep roots as a Canadian, deep roots as a child who grew up in these complex intertwined forests, and that the questions were so logical for me to ask. And I think I think that they really do expand our understanding or at least how we've understood, at least how Westerners have understood forests for the last century or more. And, um, and, and hopefully speaks also to the indigenous roots in our country where I think that this understanding is already, you know, well-founded, well understood, and really it, it, it would serve us, us all to understand this more deeply. Mm. I, I think we had such a wonderful, um, sincere thank you to you from uh, Sitsayamat uh, to, to begin with in acknowledging how also you acknowledge the Indigenous understanding, how important the trees are and how important, as she said, the mother tree is. But speaking of stories and, and when you were a kid, I wonder what kind of stories you grew up with about the forest. I think about fairy tales and it, the forest seems to be a place where children are abandoned like Hansel and Gretel or um, it's a place of danger. But indigenous stories, of course, it is a place of shelter and a place of safety. Did did you read any of those uh, fairy tales and did it did it affect how you thought of the forest as a kid? Yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, I, certainly I've read those fairy tales and they were read to me. Um, um, I know, and they were meant to sort of scare us away from forests, like the forest is a dangerous place, which is really like a European view, I think. Yeah. Um, um, but it's certainly not how I lived. Um, I read the stories, but I lived in these forests and they weren't scary to me at all. They were great places of exploration and discovery and play and um you know, climbing mountains and building rafts. I mean, to me, they were just like, like so exciting, <laughs> not scary at all. <laughs> I think you're so right at, about the Western uh, thing. Be, I, I, you know, the way towns were built, right? There were walls to keep the wild out, you know, what cities were all walled off. But I just read um, Hunting by Stars by Cherie Demoline, the Métis writer. And it is in the forest that they, the kids find safety. They're on the run, but they are so at home in the forest. Mm-hmm. And it is what gives them safe harbor. It's, it's really beautiful. And I, listen, I have to ask you about another story from your youth, because this is a critical story. And I think you know where I'm going. It involves Jigs, the dog, <laughs> and an outhouse. 
Yes. <laughs> so Jiggs was actually Uncle Wilfred's dog. Um, and he was the family dog, of course. But <laughs> um, and Jiggs was a curious beagle. And uh, I guess sort of like me in some ways. <laughs> and um, we were actually we were in uh, loggers houseboats. So my grandfather had built these loggers houseboats. And so sort of Uncle Wilfred had too. And we were moored at this bay called Cottonwood Bay. And there was an outhouse, of course, that we used that was on the shore with a gangplank up to the outhouse. And one day we were waking up <laughs> in the summertime and we heard this great howling up in the bush and we all knew right away, oh, Jigs, Jigs had fallen into the outhouse. And so everybody just rushed up to try and save Jigs and, you know, <laughs> people were running down the shore, Uncle Wilfred with his pickaxe and my grandpa with his shovel and my, my Uncle Jack was there and rushing up to this outhouse, flung open the doors and the flies are coming out and look down and there's Jigs way down at the bottom. And so, <laughs> and so we had to dig him out or at least my dad and my uncles did. And, um, and so it was just a great moment of laughter you know family laughter but also of for me this incredible um I was just you know in awe at what was being uncovered as they were you know trying to get jigs out of the soup at the bottom and that's when you know I think as I read in the book that it really solidified me this incredible world under our feet you know I I kind of knew about it because I ate dirt as a kid and <laughs> my family you know picked mushrooms and you know so the, you know the soil and the earth was part of where we came from but I hadn't seen it below that really you know other than what I put in my mouth and and, I, and it was revealed to me as they went through all these different layers. There's the forest floor and the humus, and mm -hmm. um, which happened to be like, incredible places of activity. You know, they're full of life, you know, bugs and worms and columbula and springtails and bacteria and fungi. And then underneath that, there's like this little silver layer that's, that I later learned was where all the humus had, wa had washed through and gets deposited in this other under layer, which is as red as the curtain behind you, Sheila, like a beating heart, as I describe in the book. Um, and, and below that, you know, was where Jigs was, well, way down and the, the rocks that were the alluvial rocks. And eventually, yes, we pulled Jigs out and um, I had learned so much and that's had a great time and yeah take it took him down to the lake and threw him in and washed him off and it was a it was a great story but this episode i mean less people think uh we're, we're being trivial here uh, <laughs> that, I'm, that i'm asking you a salacious question but it really incited something in you didn't it it really did. I mean, I think it was like, you know, the roots were incredible. And I had this relationship with roots already because I remember as a kid, I used to always climb trees and then fall out of the trees onto the roots and think, gosh, these roots are so strong and, you know, they don't budge against my hip and my legs. And um, and so I had this fascin fascination with roots. And I would always, I also remember falling in this big hole that was full of roots. And and so this digging process, I got to see, you know, how they had to chop through these this mat of roots and realizing this was like the foundation of the forest. This is what kept the trees up. And it also was where all these soil creatures lived and crawled all over each other. So I knew that, you know, roots were pretty special. <laughs> how old were you, Suzanne? I was about five when Jake oh, fell wow. in the Yeah, <laughs> I wasn't very old, <laughs> five or six. Yeah. Oh, old enough to keep on eating dirt for a while, I guess. Def definitely. Yeah. I still yeah. do. And I teach my students how to, to eat dirt too, because you can get a lot of flavor <laughs> and you can also you, you get to taste or get to detect the texture of the soil. You know, if it's really fine or if it's really coarse, it's really easy to tell just by chewing on a little bit of dirt. What does it taste like? Well, it depends on what part you eat. <laughs> if you eat the forest floor, and it depends yeah. on what kind of forest you're in, but if it's got maples and birches in it, it's quite sweet, um, the forest floor. If it's conifers, it's kind of sour. Um, if it's mineral soil, it's gritty and very earthy tasting. So yeah, it really just depends on what kind of forest you're in. 
Thank you. I, I want to say to people who are viewing, um, as you are already contributing questions, and that's wonderful. And I would love to be able to enfold them as our conversation is going along instead of uh, waiting till the end. So I'm then already we have six questions. I'm going to begin with uh, the first one I see. Uh, and I'll read it, Dr. Samard. In the epilogue to your book, you suggest the best way to understand how trees are interconnected is to go find a tree, your tree. Imagine linking into her network, connecting to other trees nearby. I took you up on that and set my heart on finding the tree pictured in your book with the caption thousand year old western red cedar mother tree in Stanley Park. I am thinking it must be the oldest living thing in Vancouver and I've obsessively hunted for it on several <laughs> occasions with no luck. Would you or Dr. Teresa Ryan who took the photo be able to pinpoint where this treasure is located? I can. Um, so you know where the hollow tree is? <laughs> this is, uh, okay, so I don't know all the names of the roads, but that's the, that's the road that's just west of the main road that goes over the, uh, goes over the Lionsgate Bridge. And it, as you come towards the city, um, there's a little pullout on the left and there's a hollow tree there. It's a really old tree. It's, it's actually a, a western red cedar that has died, but it's still there and kind of supported and, and cared for. And there's a little trail that takes off from there and it goes straight across, um, I think it goes to Lost Lagoon. And along the way, that's where this tree is. Um, and there's lots of other beautiful trees, but there's, yeah, there is, actually there's a junction <laughs> about a junk, yeah, a juncture at about a few hundred meters in, and there's the tree right there. Um, yeah, it's still there. <laughs> we might have to get some signage, but that, I think that's a great description. <laughs> that's a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Julie asks this question, since we're talking about your family, how much is your French Canadian identity a major way that you see yourself? You know, a really strong way, but you know, I'm embarrassed to say that I don't speak French other than what I learned in high school and I learned from my grandfather and my uncles speaking French around the kitchen table. Um, but when my dad and his brothers and sister grew up, my grandmother was actually from Finland and she couldn't understand French. Um, and so she prohibited it from being spoken when she was present, mm -hmm. um, just because she felt left out and um, disregarded. And so the language didn't get passed on to my dad's generation. And then in my generation, we learned it in high school, but I think that, you know, it wasn't as good, good of learning as Right now, when the kids can go to French immersion, my both of my daughters speak French, mm. um, but I feel like really um, hobbled by my inability to actually, you know, converse fluently in French, although I can read it and I can hear it in conversation, um, but I can't really speak it other than reading, you know, the, the odd word, and I like to mix those words up in, in conversations, as you can read in the book, um, but I'm very, very proud of my French heritage. And I'm very proud that my family came from Quebec. Um, and uh, and I, 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 yeah, I, I hope that we can, we can keep it in our family. And um, yeah, it's definitely a, a very strong part of our forestry heritage as well. <laughs> My, my grandfather, Wilfred Sutherland, uh, had tuberculosis and mm -hmm. he was told to get better. He had to work outside. So he became a logger in Manawaki, Quebec. And uh, I guess in those days, it, it would have been horse logging. Um, and you talk about how things would be very different if, if we respected some of those old traditions and mm -hmm. perhaps worked more lightly upon the land. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine the difference? I, I definitely can imagine it. I know the difference. <laughs> um, so, you know, when I grew up uh, with this small scale logging family operation, horse logging, everything was really, really small, really small, slow. Everything was just like the odd tree taken out here and there. Um, and so when I look at, looked at the landscape as a child, you know, I just saw it as an intact forest with a few little gaps in it that were created from the logging that filled in immediately with all this lush, you know, growth of the hemlocks and cedars and firs, they just burst out of the ground. So to me, it was this incredibly regenerative place in that with that kind of logging. 
And then since then, of course, everything has changed or almost everything has changed. And our landscape is logged with industrial methods where people are in machines, um, you know, using feller bunchers and hoe checkers to pull logs out. Um, but the impact on the landscape is so much more, is so much different. And I, I had the great pleasure actually uh, in this summer of going into a number of areas in the Kwakwakawa territory on um, Eastern Vancouver Island um, and looking at the logging that stretches back 130 years. And so back then it was all hand falling as well. It was clear cutting because they used steam engines to actually pull the logs from with the hand fallers in there to the ocean or to the rail beds along, along the ocean side. Um, but when you walk into those forests, of course, they've regenerated and now are called second growth forests. But the, the forest floor is still thick. It's still deep. The, the forest has rebounded like, like I learned it did when I was a kid. Um, you know, the, the trees are beautiful. Um, they're, not, they're, they're not ancient trees like what I grew up around. They're not 800 years old. They're 150 years old, but they're on their way to having full lives. But when I walk into the industrial logging, you know, uh, that's been logged with these machines, it's a completely different story because, you know, these machines actually do, you know, disturb the forest floor a lot more. Mm -hmm. And that is where a lot of our precious carbon and roots are. Um, they're planted back to, you know, plantations of one or two or for lucky three species. Usually it's only one. Mm -hmm. um, and so the forests are much simpler. The species compositions are, are different. Um, so it is, it creates a whole different kind of forest. It's, yeah, it's, it's quite, it's quite shocking, really. <laughs> I'm getting a number of questions uh, about the mother tree. And so I guess, first of all, you've had a number of eureka or aha moments, or mm -hmm. you even call one moment a merd moment. <laughs> <laughs> where, woo, you know, the, the, all, all of your lights go off. And when, when was that moment regarding the mother tree? Um, so I did, I, I did, I made these discoveries when I was in my early thirties that trees were passing carbon, photosynthate back and forth. And I met a whole bunch of resistance when I published that paper. Um, and not just in forest practices, but academia as well. And it's because it really challenged our view, or at least the modern industrial view of how forests grew, which was that they're, you know, highly competitive trees are just fighting for their own survival. They're trying to get, you know, all the light and soil resources that they can. Um, and this really, you know, it created a huge backlash. And there was a period of about 10 years or more, I guess it was, yeah, about 13 years uh, that, that I got sort of mired in this backlash. And, and so, did the so did the study of this phenomena, of this connection, these below ground connections um, in the forest. And so I set out to map, try to map what, that, what those networks in the forest look like. So let me back up a little bit. What, what <laughs> these networks are is that, you know, all of the trees in our forests in Canada, in fact, all over the world, um, have this symbiotic mutualistic association with fungi. And there are these certain fungi, uh, mycorrhizal fungi, which literally means fungus root, um, where the where the tree provides energy to the fungus in the in photosynthate, and the fungus takes that energy and uses it to grow itself. It grows itself through the soil, winding around all the pores and all the soil crumbs, and pulling out nutrients and water and delivering them back to the tree. And what I discovered is that these fungi can actually link these trees together. Um, and there are literally hundreds of species in a single forest of these fungi. And so you can imagine um, what that tapestry might look like. <laughs> I think like the one behind you, in <laughs> fact. <laughs> um, and I mapped one with my student, Kevin Byler, I mapped one species, two subspecies of this rhizopogon fungus. And we found that everything in that forest was connected by these two sister species. And the most highly connected trees, the ones that were the hubs of the of the network, were the biggest trees, and and so then I set about with a bunch of other graduate students to figure out what were these big trees doing, 
and and we did these things like planted seedlings around the trees. We we sowed seeds around them. We had seeds of different species of different genetic makeup. We had seeds from those old trees themselves. We had seeds from other trees, and we found out that these old trees nurtured the seedlings. They allow, they help them establish. They help them germinate, establish, survive, grow, improve their nutrition. And the way they did this after many, many more experiments <laughs> was they did a couple of things. One is that they supported this massive network that little trees could, could tap into to, to you know, gather up a lot of resources right away, even as they're just getting going, even before they have you know, many needles or leaves. The other thing that these old trees did is they actually delivered uh, carbon and nutrients and water directly to these little seedlings. And so this nurturing ability, I thought, you know, how can we convey this so that people understand this? And, and that's how we came up with the term mother tree, because they really were, um, the role of them in the forest was as a mother, you know, mm -hmm. and not just as an elder, but as a mother um, to, to nurture these young seedlings. Even, even in death right even even in death yeah. absolutely so you know just a reminder that this this multi-generational forest that that there it's a cycle and there's a fine line or even maybe no line between the living and the dead where you know as trees die and and um as they get old and die that they 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 also tra transmit or send messages to these young seedlings um, they send them messages about, about health, about disease, about how to look after themselves. Um, they also send energy to help them grow. In fact, what we found is about 40% of their current photosynthate ends up going straight into these little seedlings that are in their network as they die. And so, yeah, the whole dying process is really a birthing process right at the same moment. It's, it's an incredible cycle. Yeah, exactly. And I hope... Um... V-I-C-I-C, -I, I don't know how to pronounce your name, but I hope you feel that that answered the question, can you talk about what the mother tree does in the forest? Suzanne, why did you encounter such opposition to this research? I think, um, you know, I've, lo I've thought long and hard about it. And of course, at the time, and I was in my mid-30s, by the time I published this work, I was having children of my own. And um, and, and I, it took me by a surprise. You know, I, I didn't expect from the academic side, especially to have a backlash. Mm. But now I, I realize it quickly, it didn't take me very long to figure it out, but that what I was doing is challenging basic tenets of ecology and evolution, where, um, you know, competition has long, especially since Darwin published his famous papers on origin of species, and especially since the advent of capitalism, which was happening in Europe around the same time Darwin was doing his studies, um, that this idea of competition sort of being the dominant force by which their natural selection occurs and then translated into ecology, that this is how whole communities are structured is through competition. It kind of, it challenged that tenant. Um, I was showing that they actually co collaborate a lot as well. They compete, but they also collaborate. And, and I think that, that there was a threat there. There was a perceived threat that I was trying to overturn all of this great work that had been done. That wasn't my intention at all. I was just trying to expand our understanding of the multiple interactions that trees and other creatures have with each other. It's such a sophisticated um, way of conversing with each other, of communicating, of, of interacting and, and, uh, and relating to each other. Um, so th there was that aspect. And then there was also the aspect of forest management. And I think, and this is a longer conversation, but um, you know, forest management as agriculture, as any resource management really took those ideas from evolution and applied them in ecology in the management of resources. And in forestry, this led to um, you know, basically growing um, single species plantations that are spaced apart, where they're weeded of plants that are considered to be com competitors. Um, they're spaced and thinned, all to favor the dominant ones. And this resulted in the simplified forest. Um, but what I was challenging with these views that we should be more inclusive of biodiversity and all the different, you know, functions in the forest challenged 
you know, a huge industry that was built on, that a huge infrastructure was built on, you know, developing, you know, seedlings to grow so they grew fast on, you know, herbicide companies that were developing herbicides, whole consulting companies that were out spraying these forests, you know, so, so there was a great resistance to change and that still exists today. Thank you for for that uh, for that answer, and I know it is a longer conversation, and I <laughs> I wish we had more time, but I've got to tell you the questions are coming fast and furiously. So, uh, I'm going to go to uh, it looks like Mikal's question. The North Shore and Lower Mainland was logged 150 years ago. Mm -hmm. What do the trees do in the absence of the mother hub tree? Um. Well, you know, so these big old trees you could think of them like they're the grandparents of the forest, right? And so with, with those old trees, I call this wisdom, you know, some people think that's like the, the wrong work because it's very human, but it really is wisdom that is encoded in genes. It's encoded in the nutrient capital of the site. It's encoded in, in you know, the, the biomass or the logs and the branches that are left behind following a disturbance. And they really are what bootstraps the next generation of forest. You know, they provide the mycorrhizal inoculum, for example. They provide the seeds. Um, they provide um, actually nurse logs where trees can regenerate on. They provide all this platform for the new forest to, to, to grow from. If there's no mother trees left, if we log all of those or they're burned, you know, the forest regenerates. It's going to regenerate eventually. That's the beauty of, of resilience of our forest. That's so hopeful. And that's, you know, I think we all need to remember that forests do grow back. And, um, and they will stratify themselves and emerges out of that what might seem like a simple single story canopy, there's actually a lot of structure in there where you have some trees that emerge as the bigger trees. And so eventually those ones become the hubs of this below ground network and they become the mother trees. Just like in our societies, leaders emerge and we look up to them and they do you know, make hinges or they make connections in society, in our human societies, it's the same in forests. They do emerge out of the out of even a simplified forest. Here's a question um, that's it's anonymous. Uh, how old does a tree have to be to function as a hub or mother tree? The answer to this question relates to research I'm doing in West Vancouver on an area of old growth that mm -hmm. has been selectively logged, but where many mature trees of say 200 years still occur. Yeah, um, you know, every forest, even a small plant, a young plantation of five years old <laughs> or less will have this structure in it. And, and so you can even, you know, call those little seedlings that are the, the biggest, most robust ones as the mother trees in the, the seed in, in that even young plantation. Um, in fact, a lot of the research I did in forests was married with, um, with, with small trees because it's really hard to do the research I did like labeling them with isotopes. It's hard to label a 200 year old tree. So we would work with smaller trees and this structure emerges still as you know nuclei of, of these mother trees as nuclei of the forest. But let me just go a little bit further that, you know, there's old trees are a little bit different than this. They, they have different special qualities that are not captured even by the biggest trees. So when we think of old growth, for example, in our coastal ecosystems to be an old growth forest, they, they're, they're supposed to be about at least 250 years old. In interior forests, 140 years old. There's reasons for this because scientists have studied them and, and figured out that they have these you know, special emergent properties. Some of those things are, for example, um, an older tree will be host to, you know, tenfold more fungal species, for example, than a little seedling. Instead of, you know, five or six on a seedling, there'll be a hundred or more on a big old tree. And they all function, they have niches in the ecosystems that allow the tree to capture resources from this enormous pool of wealth, the nutrients, the nitrogen, the phosphorus, and so on. And the mycorrhizas help them do that. Um, Another example could be like in these big old trees, they have huge crowns that also are homes to bears and cavity nesting birds, um, ducks and wolves, or not wolves, but um, you know, large, large creatures. And that diversity matters too, because they are dispersers of seed, 
of a binoculum of the mycorrhizas. <laughs> um, they, they're connectors, they form nest webs themselves and ecosystems, but these big old trees really are, again, emerge as really important to those kinds of connections as well. So I hope that that wasn't too confusing, but just to summarize, you know, little, even little plantations have, you know, emergent larger trees, but these big old trees, the old growth ones, have especially um, important qualities that we need to save in our ecosystems. At, at one point, as you describe everything working in concert, quite literally, you talk about yeah. how it's kind of like an orchestra's going mm -hmm. on out there in the forest, right? Yes. And, and, and all of that kind of collaboration and communication. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I often think, you know, when I'm in the forest, I'm listening to a symphony. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you do hear you do hear stuff, of course, but just knowing all the the, the niches, all the players that they are working together to create this incredible wealth of an ecosystem that is so productive and so diverse and provides, you know, oxygen for us and food, you know, and for all of the creatures that live in the forest. So yeah, it really is like, a, it takes a symphony to create a beautiful piece. And that is really the, what the forest is. It's a symphony too. Uh, a question about your research, does it apply to small natural areas of urban places as well? And also, is it reasonable to consider that when trees are being cut down, they do the equivalent of cry out to others, perhaps cry in pain? And there's a PS here. So happy to be hearing you, Dr. Samard. I love your book and tell others about <laughs> it all the time. But, um, but those are two really interesting questions. And I think as people read your book, mm -hmm. they walk through cities differently. They look at trees in urban places differently. Yeah, I mean, it really isn't, I mean, it's different, but it's not that different in that, you know, trees, they grow in communities, they, they, they thrive on diversity, and they thrive in being in neighborhoods, <laughs> just like we do, right? We, we can't grow in isolation, they can't either. Um, and, and so, you know, it, even in a boulevard where you might have a row of trees and they're planted and they might be all the same species. Well, this is very common, of course, all the same species planted in even rows and, um, and there's cement and sidewalks all around them. As long as the trees have the ability to grow roots and that there aren't huge um, solid barriers between them, they will connect as well. They form mycorrhizas as well. Um, and they communicate with each other as well, not just through the roots, but trees in forests, in urban environments also communicate through the air. This isn't an area that I study, but others do, where trees will actually warn each other. They they communicate with each other about, about their environment and, and, and there's responses. So there's perceptions, responses, changes, behavior adjustments according to that language that's occurring above ground. And um, so scientists call those things floating through the air volatile organic compounds. You can think of them just as the things that you smell. <laughs> <laughs> in a forest, that's their language. That's their, them speaking to each other. Um, and of course, in urban environments, you can foster that community better by growing trees in in communities, in good soil where they can, you know, form mycorrhizas and connect together. A lot of these things we don't do in urban environments, but we really should because our, you know, our urban areas are are hot. <laughs> they're mm -hmm. impervious. Um, they're kind of hostile environments for all kinds of creatures. But trees, we all know, really improve that living space. And um, and so anything we can do, and there are so many things we can do to improve the life of trees, we should do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, the other part of that question was uh, about trees being cut down and, right. um, you know, do they, do they have the equivalent of a cry, uh, a cry of pain? You know, I, yeah, I, I'm not sure. I know. Okay. So here's one way to think of it. Cause you know, I, I'm hesitant to, to call it a cry of pain because that's so much what we do and we think, and, and I can, um, and I'm not sure that it's the same response, or it's it is it actually isn't the same the same. But there are so many parallels. So let me try to explain. You know, when a tree is injured, whether it's cut or even if you pull off a leaf or a needle or um, uh, break a branch 
or cut into a tree, um, that tree has an instant response to that injury. An instant cascade of hormonal changes go on in it where you know, a lot of uh, chemical pathways are activated, a whole bunch of byproducts, chemical by byproducts are produced, and it's instantaneous. So it's almost like, you know, if somebody screams at you, you have this, you know, this emotional response. Um, trees are doing the same thing, it's instant. Mm -hmm. And that hormonal response or that biochemical response gets transmitted through these networks below ground to the neighboring trees. And so there actually are, you know, eavesdrop, there are eavesdrop, the neighbors are eavesdropping on what's happening to those mother trees that are injured and they're understanding those messages and they actually increase their own defense. They actually upregulate their own RNA. <laughs> RNA, remember being that, you know, that me the messenger RNA that, that is the basis of our COVID vaccines. You know, trees mm -hmm. have kind of a, the neighbors have a similar kind of um, anti antibody response in upregulating their own, own RNA and produce more defense enzymes and defend themselves against whatever is around. And so, you know, is that a, a cry in pain? Well, it's definitely a message. It's definitely a message of danger and and um, and warning. So, yeah, I I think that's what I'll say, and I'll leave the rest up to your imagination. <laughs> it, is it dangerous to veer into anthropomorphism? You know, I, I, the reason I'm so hesitant is I'm trained as a scientist, right? I've, and I've been, you know, I've got, you know, three degrees in science. And um, and one of the first things that you, that you learn is you better not anthropomorphize or you're going to lose all your credibility. And um, this harkens back really to, you know, Descartes and, and the separation of man from nature. Um, our our minds from our bodies, um, and and it became sort of like a touchstone for the validity of science. And to me, as I mature, as I get older, I realize that this has actually been the Achilles' heel of science: mm. is that by removing ourselves so much from our what we study from nature, um, by not mm. acknowledging these these. Uh, mysterious things, but by being happy when we understand only half of what's going on and say, oh, we understand it all. By, by ignoring that complexity, we've simplified our ecosystems because we thought they were simple. And now the damage that's come from that is brought to bear on, you know, the on what's happening in our forests, the in insect infestations, the pathogen infestations, the, the vulnerability to wildfire and so on. And so, so I ask people in my book, and again, here too, um, to let's get back to our roots of who we really are, that these trees in these forests are our kin. They are our relatives. Um, we come, we evolve from the same basic soup of DNA. Um, and that, you know, by not treating them as, as our kin, as our relations, that we have given ourselves license to exploit these creatures to our detriment. And so I think that, you know, the fundamental thing that we have to get back um, in order to start healing our planet is, is to relate to the forest in that way as we do to our, our, our human neighbors, mm -hmm. you know, as, as our relations. And once we do that, once we start seeing them as, as, as we see each other as people, um, then we'll start caring for them. And I'll, I'll just end this by saying, you know, the, our First Nations people mm -hmm. have long recognized trees and wolves and bears as their relations and they're way ahead of West, the Western world, or maybe the maybe I should say the Western world forgot its mm -hmm. roots at some point and we need to get back to them. Okay, at this point, I am going to say I apologize for all the questions I can't get to because we still have 23 questions from <laughs> attendees and uh, I'm very grateful they are wonderful questions and a lot of people have read your book. But a, a really early question came in from Richard Walton who said, at what point did you read Richard Powers' overstory? Who influenced whom, if either? Um, yeah. <laughs> um, when did I read oh, the overstory? I read it a few years ago and I actually, I was writing my book. I think I was writing this book when his book came out and he won the Pulitzer Prize. And, and somebody says, oh, you know, 
there's a there's this character that seems like you and 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 they they study plant communication and I'm like oh that's interesting but I didn't really know anything about the book other than that it would had won the Pulitzer Prize and and then I thought well maybe I should read that book and so I read it and I'm going oh my goodness this is so much like my story and it turns out that Richard Powers did um, actually base his character uh, Patricia Westerford partly on me and partly on a couple of other women who um, who study trees and forests um, so it's kind of a combination character but um, but yeah that's when I read the book and I was just thrilled to see it because um, he did such a great job you know it's such a fine piece of literature and he did such a great job of of bringing to life you know all the people who care about forests about trees gave them characters, the complex characters, and the trees and forests themselves. So I was really happy to see that. And what came first, yeah. um, I guess I started doing this research 40 years ago. And so I guess the research came and then Richard read about it and heard about it and wrote about it. I think you could write a, a wonderful book called The Understory. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking <laughs> the same thing I could. <laughs> I think that would be, be fantastic. Yeah. That's got to be the next one, I guess. <laughs> well, while we're on a, a, um, a question about popular culture, uh, what about Ted Lasso? And, <laughs> okay, Coach Lasso, Ted Lasso, the biggest hit that's been on television over the last year, and he refers to your research to the mother tree by name. I know. I, and all I could, you know, it's so funny because I started getting these messages, Ted Lasso, Ted Lasso. And my, my daughter's boyfriend, Bobby Joe Love, who I love, <laughs> um, sent me a message almost instantly. He said, Ted Lasso, he's, your name got mentioned on Ted Lasso. Bobby um, manages my Instagram account, so he knows all about my work. And he's like, oh, wow, this is amazing. And and so then, of course, I had to watch it, and and Bobby's, you know, helping me, you know, hack into his Apple ID so I can watch this episode. And I'm, it was amazing. I mean, and I only watched that one episode, but now I know I want to watch the series because I think the story kind of parallels the story of forestry, or you know how how you know I, apparently Ted Lasso came to the UK and he was kind of like a not very well liked and was a little bit, um, you know a bit mean to his neighbor, his fellow um, players and uh, his, anyway, and so then he eventually evolved into this more caring, collaborative person, which is sort of like the tipping point in that episode, apparently. So anyway, it's, it's really cool. <laughs> it is. It is really cool. Uh, here's a question from um, somebody who has two young children, five and two. Given the importance of fostering a strong relationship with uh, the natural world, what are your suggestions for instilling this in children at a deeper level? Well, the most important thing is to take them outside, right? And um, and let them explore and um, and let's have them spend as much time out there as possible because it really is being in those spaces, in those places, in the forest that where you develop those deep connections and and get them away from their phones get them away from the distractions that don't that really make them un, not present in the real world and and you know even you know leave them out there to play for a while and and to to get maybe even get a little lost and um i mean you kind of got to know where they are kind of but <laughs> um to really make those deep connections be and being quiet in the forest and, and just making discoveries. I mean, there's nothing like being out there that makes you just want to, you know, you love, you love them to death. You don't ever want anything to happen to them. So that's what, that's what I rec rec would recommend. That's what I did with my own children. And that's how I grew up. <laughs> <laughs> um, from my 13, 11 and five-year-old daughters, a question from uh, Megan Friesen. How can we find the mother tree in the forest by our home? Just, you know, go wherever you are, just go and find the biggest tree. And, um, you know, you, one thing you can do is just look at the girth of the tree. Um, you don't even necessarily have to look up because the, the, the diameter of a tree is, is completely correlated with the height of trees. So usually if it's a big fat tree, it's also a big tall tree. Um, 
But even if it's not very tall, it still will be a mother tree because the important thing is that these trees have huge crowns. So the leaf, the leaf area, they're photosynthesizing like crazy. And that energy gets transmitted down through the trunks into the root system. And that's where all the cycles, the big biogeochemical cycles of the earth are, are actually happening in the soil, fed by these enormous roots of these enormous trees. And so, yeah, so, so yeah, just look for those big trees with a big girth and a big crown, and those are the mother trees. Thank you. Teresa just notes here, Michael Christie's wonderful novel, Greenwood, talks about the relationship amongst trees, and it also caught her interest. And it is a, it is a great, great novel too. So thank you very much for that, Teresa. Uh, I'm just looking at the time. We have about 15 minutes. <laughs> There's still 20, 22 questions, and I still have a few myself. But um, I want to I want to ask here this is a question that's very open Sylvia Garcia asks what is one of the many gifts that the forest has given you that you've applied to your own life and also adds thank you Suzanne for all you do for the forest thank you um you know it gives me a sense of peace and recovery and healing I go to the forest every day, unless I can't that day, <laughs> if I'm traveling or something, but when I miss my day in the forest, I really miss that healing moment. It's not even like I have to look at the details, I just need to walk up a trail and breathe in the scents and feel these, these gentle creatures around me and I instantly calm down. I can feel my heart, I can feel my soul breathing again. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, the forest is just an incredible healing place for me. Mm -hmm. And of course, as, in my book, I talk about even more, you know, concrete things where um, I went through breast cancer and the forest was a solace for me. I, I would go to the forest to, even though I was dead tired from the chemo, um, just go there and just be with the trees and feel envelop enveloped by them. One of the drugs that I was given in chemo was paclitaxel, which is from the yew tree. And, um, and where I live, it's full of yew trees. And so I would go to these forests and, and wrap my arms around these yew trees and thank them um, for the life that they've given back to me. And I would take my children there and we would do that. And then I, you know, the other thing I've done is I have a, a graduate student, Eva, Eva Snyder, <laughs> who, who's doing her PhD on the yew. And, um, and the, develop, and the production um, of paclitaxel by you, and how neighbors influence the production and quality of that medicine. Mm -hmm. And um, so yous connect with cedars and maples, and, and I think that community really enhances that chemistry of the trees. That's my hypothesis. Mm -hmm. um, the yew trees actually use paclitaxel for their own medicine for their own defense against mm -hmm. disease. Um, so anyway, I, I vowed to the trees when I was going through my cancer treatments that I would do this study and and yeah, it's pretty exciting. We've already found that this neighborhood of trees is highly connected and interacting. Um, so stay tuned. <laughs> that, that is a very powerful part of your book as well. And uh, and I, I love the fact that you, you pay homage to the yew trees for the gift that they have given you. I... Uh, can we have another hour? I mean, seriously, I can't believe how fast this has gone. But how can we change the way we, as, as a great big culture, Western culture, think about forests? You know, I think that shift is happening now. Yeah. I think that um, we're at a moment in, in our history, in our environmental crisis, where we have paths to choose. And, um, and I think it's clear it's clear to many people, it's clear to me which path to choose, and that is a regenerative pathway rather than a, and a continuing on the exploitive pathway that we've been on for the last century. Um, and, and I think that we know so much about forests now. I mean, we know it innately in our DNA and our bones. And when I speak of the mother tree and connection in forests, everybody gets it right away. It's because we know it in our souls. And, and so we've got the tools there, we have the knowledge, we, um, and people are making changes in how they think about forests and resources already. And I think that, you know, when we see the protests at Ferry Creek, for example, this is an expression of that knowledge and an expression for change. 
and really, you know, it's it's up to us to make those changes. But the the moment is now, and um, you know, we are in a climate crisis. We don't have a lot of time to shift, make this, you know, shift the direction of this big ship. But we can do it. You know, the trees are telling us how it happens. You know, how the forest heals. It. They've shown us this, and so really, we have the knowledge, and and we just need to make the right choices. Um, and I would say, you know, on more concrete ways, you can pressure your politicians to make better choices for us too. <laughs> um, from Heather Bowl, we, we depend a great deal on wood in our economy and our society. As only one example, the province of British Columbia now allows buildings over five stories to be built with wood. Um, are you hopeful for changes in silviculture and the use of wood? And I'm, I will throw in policy. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and do you have hope for the stewardship of our forests? Well, I mean, hope is what we depend on. And I do have hope. I, you know, changes happen. And, and I've studied, you know, eco ecosystems. They're a lot like social systems in that when you start to make changes, it can seem imperceptible at first. And you almost give up because you think, oh, nothing ever changes. But then when there's enough people in place, enough policies have shifted, practices have, have moved, you start to see these changes and then it can be dramatic and rapid if we make put the right things in place. And so that's in incredibly hopeful and it's incredibly possible. We have all the tools there to do that. Um, and yeah, and so we we need to do it. And I don't think I don't. It's not rocket science. It's choices. It's about making those correct choices. And I can't remember the beginning of that sentence, but <laughs> <laughs> okay. or that question. Uh, but, but hope. It, it. I think it is a lot about hope. But um, hope for, or are you feeling optimistic about the way silviculture is practiced in the province? <laughs> Well, currently, silviculture practices are not very good. Um, I, oh, I should say, we have the foundation for it, right? We, we have a good understanding of our ecosystems. We know what grows here. We have a really good science-based foundation for do making, making good practices. We just haven't shifted um, away from some really draconian policies that really compel um, us to reforest our landscape with simple plantations made of conifers that actually are really increasing the vulnerability of our landscapes. Mm -hmm. By weeding out birches and aspens and cottonwoods and understory plants, we increase the flammability of our landscapes. Mm -hmm. By taking away the old mother trees, we reduce the genetic capacity of our landscapes. Um, and so yeah, we, I, I know that we can do better. We have knowledge to do better, to change civil culture so that it's based more on the values of the forest ecosystem rather than on these simplified products. And those values need to include things like our spirituality, the ability to store and sequester carbon, the ability to make oxygen out of <laughs> out of CO2, out of photosynthesis, the, the ability to house biodiversity, all of these things are the cornerstone to our, our lives. And um, and so we can do civil culture that can honor those things. Um, so far, it hasn't done that. It's actually been the source of loss of biodiversity, the, the way that we've lost carbon from our ecosystems and people feel disenfranchised from the very places that we live in. Um, but we need to, we have to get this back and get back on the right track. I wanna ask a question that I'm curious about, because reading reading the book, I know that public speaking wasn't your thing when you first <laughs> began to speak in public, but you were, you know, you were sort of um, charged, the gauntlet was thrown down by, by your then boyfriend, Don, who became your husband, who said you can't hide if you want change. Mm -hmm. What does what that, that phrase meant to you over your life, Suzanne? You know, I, I grew up as, I was so shy. I, I mean, I was a really shy kid. I sucked my thumb till I was 12. I, I think that I, you know, I'm, I might be unique in that way. <laughs> um, I hid behind my mom's Probably because it tasted like dirt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I <something, laughs> probably did. I, it was covered in dirt most of the time. But um, yeah, and, and then I, I got th through, through high school being incredibly shy. And then I went to university and I, realized I took a public, oh, I had to take this public speaking course. I was just like terrified of it. And I was asked to give a talk on the spot and I froze. 
And I couldn't get, and I was given one word to talk about. That word was dog. I could have talked about jigs, you know, it would have been so easy, but I didn't think of that. And, and I froze. And then I, I said to myself, you can't go on with your life like this. You've got to be able to have certain basic skills. Otherwise, you know, you're not going to do anything. And so I learned how to speak and I learned how to write. Well, I could write already, but I learned how to write better. Um, I learned some basic communication skills and then, over the years, I just I just worked and worked at it. You know, I started off terrible and I ended up being a decent speaker. Um, and it's just through sheer will and practice. <laughs> I'm sure you could offer your own wisdom on how you've done it too, Sheila. Oh, like, heavens. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love a microphone. I do. I have to admit, um, it's real life that I have real difficulty with. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> put but, me in a party and I'm terrible yeah, but yeah. you know I, I can speak me too <laughs> on me too <laughs> yeah <laughs> thank you thank you for answering that question because I think people people do want to know what they do but they feel they can't they can't get past their their shyness or their introversion but you are living proof. you can do it yeah I think just practice and being really well prepared and then you get through the first one and it might not be great but just keep going yeah. you know practice really does make well, it's never perfect, but practice makes interesting. <laughs> oh, that's even better. That's way better than perfect. <laughs> a couple of questions about, is there such a thing as a father tree? For sure. You know, and I mean, again, I'm going to, I'm going to invoke First Nations culture where, and, and lots of nations around the world, um, call these old trees grandfather trees or grandmother trees or father trees or mother trees and a lot of the species of trees in the world have both <laughs> sexes right within the same individual um, including most of our trees except for the yew trees in in Canada um, and so really you know these mother trees are really parent trees or elder trees but I use the term mother tree to invoke that idea of nurturing so that we understand immediately you know the role of these trees in the forest but certainly there are father trees and grandparent trees and grandfather trees as well. <laughs> um, there is a question about I think I've just lost it but uh, do bamboo trees have a mother cane? Wow. I don't know. Okay. I, I'm stumped. Yeah. <laughs> Not much about bamboo. All, all right. <laughs> all, okay. That's fine. We'll just, we'll carry on. Um, the impact of invasive non-native worms on trees, mm -hmm. but, but also let, you know, if you want to throw in the pine beetle, mm -hmm. we do see resilience, but what, what do the trees have to go through? <laughs> Well, I mean, a lot of trees die, of course, um, but they also, I'm just going to talk, so the earthworms are a special case. Um, they do change our ecosystems in dramatic ways, and I just want to put that out there, that they're not native to, to, to Canada, um, that they, they actually bring up nutrients from deep in the soil, churn the soil, and make it seem like it's more fertile, but it's actually not that great for our native forests. Um, as far as the mountain pine beetle goes, um, interestingly enough, that, that the inf in infestation by mountain pine beetle actually, of course, causes all kinds of responses in the old trees. And what we found is that, 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 that messages actually transmit through the mycorrhizas to the next generations of seedlings, which affects their ability to produce monoterpenes, which is a defense um, chemical in pine seedlings. And this affects the genetics of multiple generations down the road. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I mean, the, the mountain pine beetle has co-evolved with lodgepole pine in our forests. And I think that that is borne out in what I just said about these. this co-evolution means that there is a conversation going on that crosses generations. And it's it's not all a bad thing. It's just that climate change on top of that has created a, an imbalance in these forests and in this co-evolved relationship. And, and I think that there are going to be, there are resistant trees, there are going to be resistant newcomers or new, new generations of trees. Um, and these forests will eventually, in my view, regenerate. They're going to look different because climate is changing, but there, there are, there is resistance in the populations, natural resistance. 
Okay, I have I have a five minute warning, but I'm not sure when it happened. Um, maybe <laughs> I, so. That's that's great. Um, I I want to ask you a question about the time of year that we are in in universities, and it's convocation time. Um, a lot of uh, universities will be having in person convocations. If you were to address convocation, and you probably have already uh, at various universities across the country. But right now, what would you be wanting to tell people as they go out into the world? Um, well, I think one of the things that's front of mind of many students is global change and climate change. And I think there's a lot of fear and anxiety. Um, there's depression. Um, there's where do I fit in this big picture? And I think my message to you is that we are, as I said, we, are, we have evolved to heal. Um, our ecosystems are poised to recover, um, that they need our helping hand, and that you as an individual, as a new person coming up in your career, that you have agency in this, mm -hmm. that, that, that there's a very positive relationship that, that can exist between humans and nature. We've just kind of lost our path for a bit, but we can get it back. And, and I would call on people to, to be part of that change, um, to make it part of your everyday life, to, um, to, and, and to hold our leaders to task when they promise to do something and then they backtrack on those promises because we need them to keep them. Um, we have really, you know, we, ha we have no choice but to make dramatic changes coming forward, but we can do it. And just, you know, I, I call on everybody to be part of that change. And stay curious. And stay curious, yeah. yes. Yeah. And stay hopeful. Mm. And stay happy. And, and then when you have those things, you'll have much more resources to go forward and, mm. and be a productive member of all this change. All right. I, I've got, I, I do, again, I want to say thank you so, so much to the people who have, have asked questions. Um, I'll, I'll go with Marianne Pangeli's question, just saying, Thank you to you, Dr. Samard, Suzanne, for bringing <laughs> ancient wisdom forward. I've always felt a pain in the heart when I've seen clear-cut forests, or even if trees in our cities are smashed down. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think I'm the only one to feel that way. Do you think, mm -hmm. do you think we might have a forest gene? <laughs> well, we, we certainly evolve from the same backbone of DNA, right? So, you know, the first creatures that, that inhabited the terrestrial landscape were, um, you know, were plants that had co-evolved with fungi and moved onto land and oxygenated our environment. And, and so, yes, and then eventually evolved higher level plants and eventually evolved, you know, vertebrates and eventually human beings. And so we are all part of this phylo phylogeny or phylogenetic tree. We are related at, you know, back in millions of years ago. So, so yeah, I mean, it, the trees are our ancestors, really. They're in our genes. We have shared uh, gene sequences and um, yeah, and and. I think it, it's comforting to know that they've been around for a long time and they're patiently waiting for us to just learn a little bit more. <laughs> One more question from, uh, from the viewers. This is Joan Sharp. I'm going to cut to your, right to your question, Joan. Can you talk a little bit about what it takes to be a field biologist who can commit so deeply to living in and growing to understand the forest that you studied despite your connections to family and life outside the field? Yeah, it's kind of a unique um, job to be a field biologist, and, and I encourage people to, to do it um, because it's so enriching um, to be a naturalist in so many ways, to, to really, you know, I, I think a lot of people, you know, today are really enamored by, you know, lab work and molecular biology and genetics, which is all good. You know, we need that too, but we've some, some in some ways, with all that glamour, we forgot about the nat natural life of the field biologist. And, um, and, and so I invite you to go and observe nature because, you, you know, that's, that's an essential part of it to, to see these creatures, to study them, to, to be with them um, and, and live that life that is free, right? It feels so free. You know, 
I mean, it has its pressures too, especially for women with children. You know, I know that I had a lot of pressures like that and all the people, the women that I worked with, but you, you know, bring your kids to the field or, or, you know, work part time or, you know, figure out a way that you can envelop that field biology into your life because it will be good for your kids too. That is a great answer, and uh, I I want to say thank you so much on behalf of of the audience, um, on behalf of me. Uh, thank you for entertaining yeah. all of our questions, and I I want to say thanks to Jigs as well. <laughs> <laughs> Jigs up in heaven. <laughs> yep. Whatever Jigs, if you hadn't fallen into the outhouse, where would Suzanne Simard be right now? I'd be nothing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, and thank you. So, thanks. And such gratitude for this beautiful, profound book. And thank, thank, you, thank you for our conversation, Suzanne. Thank you, Sheila. That was really fun and lovely. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yes, um, the, I'm Sarah. I'm with the North Vancouver District Public Library. And on behalf of the North Shore Libraries, we are so grateful that both of you could be here. And I think I'm not alone in wondering when the uh, Suzanne and Sheila podcast is going to start so we can <laughs> listen to you every week because I'm sure we did not get our fill. And, and as you said, Sheila, there were so many brilliant questions and we really do thank everyone for being so engaged and for giving us these beautiful questions. And if you haven't had a chance to read Finding the Mother Tree, all three of our libraries have many copies. So come and get one from our libraries. And of course, your local bookstore will be a great place to get pick up that book. And we really do encourage you to give this fascinating and really hopeful, really hopeful book a read. It's worth your time. Uh, if you have any feedback about this event, you can email us at the email that sent you the Zoom link. Um, and we really do thank you all for being here tonight. And uh, I do wish on behalf of everyone a safe, safety, warmth, comfort, happiness, and joy. And I hope you can get into a forest sometime soon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.